7.30. Any questions? No, they got another 30 seconds. No questions? That must be. Sorry, I'm still questioning. So one of the questions yesterday was about aluminum sculpting. And I talked about the price of aluminum and stuff. So there is this book. Did you turn things on now? Yeah, it's on. Okay. <clears throat> book from Monopoly to Competition and Transformation of Alcoa, uh, which was Charles Martin Hall's company. And here's the space shuttle on top of the NASA 747. And here's one of the Pittsburgh reduction companies, which was the beginnings of Alcoa on the bottom. But opening this thing up, here is a picture of the Napoleonic baby rattle made of aluminum. About, 19, about 1850, okay? And why would the emperors, well, here's a picture of the, the top of the Washington Monument, okay? Which the Washington Monument was the early 1880s, uh, and so aluminum was more valuable than gold, and to prove that to you, here is a list of the prices of aluminum from 1852 to 1897, in dollars per pound. In 1852, France made aluminum, and you could buy it for $545 a pound. Okay? So I don't know if that's a pound or a troy, troy pound or what, but if you divide by 16 to get ounces, or 12 to get ounces, you get something more than $25. Okay? And the price of gold back then would have been $25 an ounce. Okay, in 1852. So this was more expensive than gold in 1852. You saw the price came down, but it really wasn't until 1886 when Hall and Thoreau developed their process, and then the price started dropping dramatically over the next uh, 10 years or so. And remember what I said, if you, if you uh, cut the price of a material in half, you will should the volume of use over the long run should increase by about a factor of four, okay? So uh, on a constant dollar value, the price of aluminum continues to come down, but it's still, because it has so much energy content, it's still considered, uh, uh, it's still more expensive than, than iron <coughs> on a per pound basis. Sometimes people describe aluminum as canned electricity. In fact, one of the earliest exports when the former Soviet Union uh, kind of broke up and things was aluminum because they had huge facilities. But if nothing else, the Soviets not being bound by rational economics. When the five-year plan says we're going to produce five times as much titanium or something, they would just go out and build these huge plants that no businessman could ever justify, okay, economically. And so they had these facilities, they didn't have the pipelines to carry oil and gas to Europe, which is what they're living off of now. It took about 10 or 15 years to build that. Um, and so early on, around 1990, they just started exporting metals. And essentially, you can take all your hydroelectric power and you can export that electricity because you can transport the aluminum. Okay, that's how you make aluminum with electricity. Um, most of the big electricity or the big aluminum producers are places where they have a lot of cheap hydroelectric power up in Canada, uh, Norway, Brazil, okay, wherever you got cheap. In fact, the first place in the United States, if you look in that book, one of the first places they, they built a large uh, uh, plant to use the whole process was Messina, New York. What's near Messina, New York? Niagara Falls, exactly. Okay, big electrical powerhouses to generate. Because to make aluminum, you basically have a pot, maybe half the size or the size of this room, um, with tons of triolite in it, and you might pump 200, 500,000 amps at like three or four or five volts. Okay, so you have big copper bus bars. Actually, they probably use aluminum. In some cases, but in many cases they end up having to use power. Okay, so that's a little bit on that. Um, anybody else that's come in have any questions? I'll sometimes tell stories at the very beginning that I make up if you don't ask questions <laughs> to allow people to get here, but you're supposed to be here at 7 30. 
Um, so today's lecture is a little bit different. I'm not going to continue on with metals um, and the other metals other than iron. I will do that the next time. And frankly, I still don't know whether I'm going to be in California on Monday or whether I'm going to be here on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I know I'm going to be going on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week. But tomorrow, Brian will show you, or, or Kevin will show you the, uh, the first video on the, the welding stuff about why welding is important or joining is important. And then on Monday, you'll either get another video or you'll, you'll get me live. And if it's me live, I will continue on with the, with the uh, metals. But today, because there was a question in the class about composites, right? And I don't usually say much about composites, because you're going to find this is sort of a, like, this is somewhat of a negative uh, story about composites. I don't, and Jerry, we ran out, by the way, of, we know about, of course, set notes two, but this is net, uh, set one. <coughs> I was going to you, someone else was missing one. Okay. If, anyway, if anybody's missing the welding set, there's three sets up here. And Jerry said by tomorrow she should have the others copied, extra copies of the, the second set. I don't know how it, and I think there may be one person who's come and hasn't signed up, so I'll leave this up here where I can check and pass it around. Who's the person? Anybody not signed up? Okay, yeah. So if you want to pass it back to the floor. Um, I think you may already have a copy of this paper, which I wrote in 1991, on weather advanced materials. Uh, you have to understand the context of the times. Um, uh, Reagan came out with Star Wars in 1985 or so, and all of a sudden we saw a huge switch of the research that was being supported by the federal government go towards things like composite materials. And then people were talking about fine ceramics back then because there was a big push by the Department of Energy. Someone had learned that ceramics melt at high temperatures and they determined that you should make engines, not only automobile engines, but turbine engines out of ceramics. And some of the ceramists had come along and said, oh, yes, we can do that. And that's because the ceramists had never studied fracture mechanics. They didn't know that things would break. Okay. They also had this, this theory that ceramics didn't corrode, okay? That they were immune to corrosion somehow, okay? These things weren't exactly true, but it was good for selling people, and you had managers down there who wanted to believe anything. Uh, anybody know who advised Reagan on starting Star Wars? It was Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, was the, the guy who really told him, oh, we should create a, a, a space-based missile defense system, and you can just do it for a merely $100 billion. Well, it really would have cost a trillion dollars or something. But that's a typical physicist approach to life, is to undersell on the beginning, OK? And that's Sprague's law. Whenever you first hear about advanced materials, not just advanced materials, write it down, because uh, it'll be the best properties you ever hear about it. Uh, and then, Williams Corollary, you know, write down the cost because it's the lowest cost it'll ever have. But it's a typical approach, and you can look through history at all kinds of things. They were going to build build this for that or whatever. The big dig here in Boston, they're going to build it for one one or two billion originally. The final price was only sixteen. Okay, and we don't even know. Actually, we don't even know what the final price is. Okay, we're still still paying for it. Um, but it's a typical thing. You you undersell it. And you over over promote it, and to a certain extent, that's the problem with ceramics, not ceramics, but composites. Um, that they, I used to say, they're the material of the future. They always have been, and they always will be. Okay. Now, having said that, there's always the exception that proves, proves the rule. The largest volume of structural material made in the world is a composite. Portland cement, concrete, right? You take Portland cement, mortar, and you mix it with stone, and you cast it, and you make concrete. And some of that stuff's been around for 2,000 years. The Romans built things that are still in pretty good shape uh, out, of, out of concrete. It's a composite material. Uh, in that case, you take the cheapest kind of structural material you can think of, crushed stone, and you use it as filler in something that's more expensive. So a composite, in my definition, 
is a marriage of two materials to try to obtain, obtain the benefits of both. Portland cement, you take a more expensive mortar, which is a good adhesive for other things, and you put a filler in, stone, and you actually end up, the stone actually in some ways gives it some strength, it gives it wear resistance. You just think of mortar, you know, between the bricks. The cement um, is not as wear resistant, it's not as strong as concrete, okay, if you, if you make it right. So there's a huge, that is the largest structural material, 1.6 trillion tons a year. So when I say we don't use composites a lot, I'm really talking about advanced composites. And I've already told you about, uh, I went to my shelf today. I actually created this lecture starting at 6 o'clock this morning. Uh, so um, I went to my shelf to pull off and I thought, well, I don't have very many composites. <coughs> but I do have this thing I've already passed around, part of the X-33 space plane which is a honeycomb uh, of Kevlar, actually Nomex, which is a competitor, but it's basically the same thing as Kevlar. And then it's got a graphite fiber uh, epoxy composite skin that they adhesively bond to the surface. And I pointed out these things, the, the shell here came in at $12,000 a pound fabricated. But it's okay, it's a space plane and its value is $20,000 a pound to get payload into orbit, right? So you can afford to pay $12,000 a pound for that application. The problem is you can't pay those kind of, that kind of money for other things. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, a guy out of Aspen, Colorado, Amory Lovins, who loves to go around saying that, um, the people in Detroit are idiots. Now, this was before they actually proved that they were idiots, okay? Uh, financial idiots, anyway. Um, uh, but he said, they could build a 100 mile per gallon vehicle today. This is, he was saying this 20 years ago. And they won't. And so this was the great conspiracy theory of Amory Lovins. <coughs> Detroit wouldn't build a 100 mile per gallon vehicle because, I don't know, I don't even know what his arguments were. Um, but that was ridiculous on the face of it. If I had the technology to build a competitive 100 mile per gallon vehicle, you don't think I'd do that? You don't think I would have taken over the marketplace? But you just put a qualifier in there. What? Competitive. competitive. See, I had to put that in there because he, in a sense he's absolutely right. We could build a 100 mile per gallon vehicle and we could have done it in 1990. The problem is and actually, we do build things with that kind of technology. They're called Indianapolis racers, and they cost about a million apiece, okay? And they have all kinds of fancy composites and titanium and everything else in them. But not everybody, my daughter totally far, okay? She calls me up yesterday afternoon and tells me, okay, Dad, I totaled the car. So I gotta buy her a new car. Well, okay, um, I'm not gonna spend a half a million dollars on it. Okay, so um, that's just me, you know. Well, I mean, it's not just me, it's a few other people. So far as making things out of advanced materials, and people, Alcoa in the 1990s was big on pushing the all aluminum automobile. Well, here's Andrew Mellon in his aluminum Pierce Arrow, probably about 1930 or so, okay. They built all the aluminum Duesenbergs in the 1930s. That's not composite materials, but we can make things out of lightweight materials, but not at a cost that was competitive with what you could make out of something else. And that's part of the problem with most composites when we're talking about advanced materials. And when I'm talking about composites, I'm really talking usually in some, giving my naysaying, I'm talking about advanced material composites. So let's talk about why Tom Eager is so negative on, on uh, composites. Uh, it is the marriage to try to get the benefits of both. We talked about concrete being the most widely used, so that's the exception that proves the rule. Um, and I talked about some of the most sophisticated systems are made with composites, spacecraft, okay? The V-22 Osprey, what do we call that now in the Marine Corps? Something about the Marine Corps, you serve on ships with them, right? Anyway, 
V-22 Osprey is a tilt rotor helicopter plane, you know, and so I actually worked on Ship 4 crash in Patuxent River. Um, and uh, the, the Navy had a court of inquiry that came out with 30, 397 findings of fact. And um, they concluded that it was a seal that had been placed in backwards, a rubber seal that had been put, placed in backwards and allowed oil to leak into the engine and caused the, uh, the engine to uh, surge, or the jet engine to surge, uh, or turbine engine, not jet, uh, turbine engine to surge. Um, that, that theory required six miracles in a sequence, okay? I investigated it and I came up with a theory that only required one miracle, okay? In sequence also, okay? One in sequence is a lot easier to do. Um, and it turns out I went to trial, I convinced the jury, that four women told the Philadelphia Inquiry that I was the one that convinced them, um, Philadelphia Inquiry, the, the newspaper. And it turns out the Judge Advocate General Corps then went back and redid the Navy report, and the Navy redid the report and came up with my theory, okay? Um, but nonetheless, what happened, uh, the V-22 could never have been built without advanced composites. That aircraft is so complex. I remember when, they, when I went down to, to Texas to look at one of these things, and this was the next eight that were being fabricated at the time. This was the development phase, and so they built the first, uh, first eight or something as test planes. And then the next eight were kind of the ones that are going to be, you know, the development planes. And then the next thing they're going to go into production. And this whole program, if you remember, took like 30 years. And it was only supposed to take five or so. The planes were supposed to cost like five million dollars. They ended up coming in at what last I heard was 43 million. Then someone said they were up to the 60 million dollar category. Just about bankrupt the Marine Corps. But but it is a fantastic machine. But anyway, the first time I saw that nacelle opened and looked in there, I thought. This looks like a nuclear submarine, okay? I never saw anything so complex, okay? With all the piping and stuff in there. And I thought, how could something like that fly? Well, it turns out it does fly. It actually flies pretty well, as long as everything works. Um, but it had to be made out of composite because if they didn't make it out of composite, it would have had zero payload. <coughs> and it wouldn't be very useful without a payload, okay? Or it would have zero range. I mean, no. And that's not really good when you're taking off from the ship to not have a very long range. Okay, you always have to take off from port. You know. Uh, anyway, uh, the 787 Dreamliner of Boeing is. You might have the numbers. It's it's like 70 or 80 percent composite. You have to remember the 777 started in around 1990 or whatever was also supposed to be about 70 or 80 percent composite. It came out a little closer on time. The 787 Dreamliner is. What, three or four years behind and still not there yet. Um, and I'm sure a lot of it is part of the problems with composites. They actually <coughs> yanked out most of the composites, and there are actually articles about how they had to take the composites out of the 777, even though they wanted to put them in, but they got into cost of manufacture. When does it go from being an alloy to a composite? Well, I'm going to actually give you some examples here. Well, it would be a composite, it's the marriage of the two materials. So. From a material scientist point of view, an alloy is something that, in general, you mix together sort of like a solution. You know, you put salt in water and it forms a single phase. Whereas a composite is two things that are mixed together, where you can still distinguish the properties of each one. In fact, Gibbs in thermodynamics defined a phase as something where the properties were indistinguishable. Okay. And so a composite is really a mixture of two phases, if you will, two or more phases. So I could have stone in cement, I can have ceramic in metal, I can have a polymer in metal. There's two, at least two phases, okay, of a material mixed together to try to give you the benefits of both, okay? An alloy is sort of, you know, I mean, material scientists could argue about this definition. Alloys, you basically, you know, when you heat them up in liquid phase it's all one liquid okay a lot of these ceramics you can't even liquefy them. you can't even you don't have the advantage of being able to cast them these things don't melt okay carbon doesn't melt it sublimes and I make I showed you the carbon carbon composite before okay 
Um, the X-33 space plane couldn't have been built without composites. It would have been too heavy to get off the ground. But when we talk about composites, it's basically a marriage of two materials. Now, we often think about something like a metal and a ceramic. So I spent yesterday afternoon and part of the evening reading a doctoral thesis from India um, uh, on a metal ceramic composite. Okay, it was aluminum silicon carbide. Um, this stuff got to be very popular after around uh, 1990. Uh, there was a tremendous move in the, the U.S. military for the Star Wars thing to come up with fancy composite materials because a lot of the stuff was going to be space-based and they needed composites and there was this guy down at the office of naval research and he used to get all kinds of money from his management. Okay, He had more money than anybody else at ONR and there was a, like a multi-million dollar program up on the fourth floor here that he was funding on metal matrix composites. Okay, um, And they were talking about how well these will be in applications within the next few years. Well, they're still not in applications and so now that I'm, I'm getting theses from India uh, about these materials. Most people walk away from them. It turns out that guy at Austin A Research after about 10 years of funding this work, he decided he'd been funding the wrong work, and he decided he needed to make cheaper composites rather than fancier composites, which was exactly the same thing as one of my colleagues over in, in uh, mechanical engineering. In the first group of LFM students in 1989, he advised a couple of them at Boeing, and they went off to Boeing, and they were looking at putting composites into the 777. And he came back after six months. He had done, he had gained tenure at MIT in mechanical engineering by making better and better composite materials, stronger, okay? And he came back and said, I've been working on the wrong thing. I've been trying to make stronger composites. I should be making cheaper composites. So he changed the focus of his research in 1989 based on going to Boeing and realizing Boeing was not going to be able to put these composites into the 777 because they couldn't afford them, okay? Now, for the X-33 space plane or the B-22 Osprey or something, when you have to do it, you can do it, but you're going to pay the price. Amory Lovins is right. We can build Indianapolis racers, and they're very light, and they can get the equivalent of 100 miles an hour. Not that the Indianapolis racers do. They go a little too fast for that. But you can build a car on that type of technology, and you can get 100 miles an hour. It's just no one can afford it. And that's one of the problems, one of the <coughs> The tensions in composite materials is you don't have the volume to get the manufacturing economies of scale. When I talk about this uh, X33 spray plane, the actual materials cost here, remember I said the typical materials cost on most fabricated things is 10%? No, the materials cost here is probably less than 1% of that $50 million for that structure. Okay? I doubt the materials of that 4,000 pound structure, which costs $50 million, this Kevlar foam or core honeycomb, it's an off-the-shelf item, okay? Yeah, it might cost $10 a pound, $10 versus $12,000, I mean, that's not a big cost, okay? Uh, the uh, epoxy composite, uh, you know, uh, carbon fiber epoxy composite, even if they're using $100 a pound um, carbon fibers, which they probably weren't, you can get carbon fibers down. Or twenty dollars a pound now. They used to cost a hundred dollars a pound. You know, so what if you're paying twenty dollars a pound when your when your fabricated component is twelve thousand? Where does the twelve? Where does that all the rest of that money go? It goes into the tooling. Okay, they had to build whole structures in order to lay the stuff out into the shape they wanted, and those structures had to be able to go into an autoclave where they treated the the adhesive. And then they had to come out of the autoclave. Now, in order to make these the least expensive, because they only had to build, let's see, eight foot, they, met, they built either 10 or 12 of these sections. It took four to build the, build the tank, and they had to make two tanks. I think they made 10. They made two extras, okay, of you know, these, these quarter sections of, the, of the, the, the part. And these parts were about the size of a two-story house. A small two-story house, a 2,000 square foot house, 
they were good sized tanks, but they only weighed 4,000 pounds. That's how light they were. I mean, you know, this thing's featherweight, right? You know, we're passing around it. Um, it's amazing how light it is. And it's relatively strong, but it has, it's very complex. And the thing to kill that, in fact, was the difference coefficient, differential coefficient of expansion of the composite materials. I had to cool it down to liquid hydrogen temperatures, 20 degrees uh, Kelvin, and because this, the carbon fiber and the epoxy and everything expanded at different rates, they got micro cracks, which they didn't expect. And the liquid hydrogen got in between the cells, and when they warmed it back up, the thing just went poof, as the liquid hydrogen vaporized into gas and built up pressures, it just blew itself apart internally. So when you make a composite, when you marry these materials, you're trying to get the benefits of, of two of them, but you're giving up all these other things. And I told you that selection of materials is multidimensional. And one, most of these people think, well, I'm just going to improve the strength of a composite. Well, it's not just strength. Um, uh, you have, and I actually wrote that paper, Wither Advanced Materials, and it actually looked. The, Ratio analysis diagram where I put all of the steel, aluminum, plastics, and composites on the same thing. This is the paper in 1991 when I put that, published that in. But I also have these old overheads of trying to explain, and these are in that paper, okay, that same paper, the multidimensionality of material selection, which is why I think you may already have this paper. But for a metal, you could plot, let's say, six attributes that you're interested in. Strength is often one for a structural material, but we've already talked about toughness. But you also, we've talked about cost, which is the invert, affordability is the inverse of cost. And I plot it as affordability rather than cost because I want goodness to be further out on the axis. Yeah. Um, would it be possible, to, um, with, with the cost being the main, main uh, or big factor here, if Economies of scale could be gotten kind of up and running for these type of materials. Would that absolutely? Be able to? And that's the theory. Okay, mm -hmm. but you got to find the application where you can have large economies of scale. Okay, and so it's a sort of a chicken and egg. You know, how do you get the cost down to get the economy to put it into design into something with economies of scale? Which one comes first? Okay, it is a chicken and egg. But that's always the argument people make. Oh, well, let us go into production. We'll lose money on the first few, and we'll make it up on all the others. Well, when you're building spacecraft, don't count on it, OK? If you, there are applications of composites in automobiles, and they work, OK? I mean, a lot of the plastics that go in automobiles are really composites. They're a mixture of some plastic resin and glass fibers, OK? So now it turns out. That plastic injection molded, or uh, not injection, well, but injection molded, but uh, there's something else where they basically take big sheets <coughs> and they sort of form it. I can't remember. Reaction injection molded. Hydroforming. Uh, well, not hydroforming metals. Anyway, there's, I'm not a plastic guy, can't think of it right now, uh, what, what the technical term is. It costs about twice as much as steel, but it's much lighter. And it turns out, uh, Professor Clark, uh, 15 years ago, uh, was helping one of the big three automotive companies, I think it was Ford, maybe the GM, uh, evaluate plastic truck beds for pickup trucks. And it turns out they made a bunch of them. They were expensive because they only made a few of them. They gave them to coal mining operations and places like that to really you know, give them a tough beating in. And it turns out the, the companies wouldn't give them back when, you know, so the the automotive company could evaluate them because you could throw anything in that plastic truck bed and it didn't dent. Okay, whereas the old metal ones, hey, you know, the the, the rear the rear door wouldn't pull down after two weeks because they've been dumping gravel and other stuff in there and it all been bent up and the metal deformed. Whereas the plastic, hey, it had it was compliant, wasn't a stiff material, it would give, had a lot of elasticity, and so. <coughs> It wasn't for aesthetics, it wasn't for lightweight. They just liked it because it didn't wear out in that application, okay? And so it turns out they actually 
you can buy. If I look at my Chevy Avalanche right now, it's got a plastic liner. Okay, the whole the whole you know bed of that pickup truck is basically plastic now. 15 years later, right? Even though it costs a little bit more, it doesn't look anywhere near as ratty as my old 2000 Chevy Silverado, which had a, a metal bed that I had to pay an extra thousand dollars to get a plastic liner in, right? So I'm not saying composites don't have applications, but we do have this chicken and egg problem. How do you get the volume to get the cost down? <coughs> okay? And you can in certain cases, but in the really high performance composites, save it for a spacecraft, okay? Where you can afford 20,000 pounds. What I'm trying to show here is goodness is further out on the, on the six axes, corrosion resistance, joinability, formability, okay? So this is sort of a generic metal. If you look at a ceramic, and you have to remember this is 1991, and Austin A Research is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into metal ceramic composites for Star Wars and stuff. Ceramics, we all know, have fantastic strength. The toughness sort of sucks, okay? We know that. Formability, well, you can cast it. Got any other forming techniques? You can cut the diamonds, okay? Uh, it's not very formable unless you want to cast it. Affordability, well, the cheapest ceramics are very affordable, but these really high quality ceramics are, are actually fairly pricey. Um, Okay, zirconium oxide and stuff. Corrosion resistance, it's better than a typical metal, let's say, but it's really not fantastic. And I haven't put in some other things on here. There are other dimensions. I just kind of chose six dimensions here. My choice. And if you put those together into a metal ceramic composite, this is what you get. You actually, you don't gain a lot in strength, you don't gain much in toughness. Formability actually sort of goes to pot. You can't machine an aluminum, silicon, carbide, and ceramic with anything except diamond tools because it's got the ceramic in it. The corrosion resistance is terrible, okay? All you've not done now is you put some cathodes in with some anodes and some corrodes. In fact, the Navy once developed a super corroding alloy. It was magnesium uh, carbon composite which if you look on the galvanic series, one's at the top and one's at the bottom, okay? And the reason they did it was it had two applications. One is if you put it in a piece of pla in a plastic shell and carry it, a diver carried it with him and then broke the plastic down under, under, under the water, it would corrode so fast that it would generate heat to keep him warm, okay? In fact, you couldn't even polish these things in the laboratory on a, on a with a, a water-based uh, uh, polishing wheel because it would corrode faster than you could polish it. Okay, you had to do an oil-based system. The other application was for salvage. You put this in plastic, take it down to the bottom, take some big plastic tent down there, crack it open, it generates hydrogen gas, and now you have a, a gas generator at the bottom of the ocean that'll help float the thing to the surface, right? That was why the, the Navy in Port Huanumi <coughs> <coughs> to generate heat for divers and to generate gas for salvage. Okay, now it's hydrogen gas, which you have to be careful not to have people throwing their cigarettes overboard as it pops to the surface. Anyway, um, anyway, uh, ordinarily it's okay to throw cigarettes in the ocean. Okay, when was that they were developing that? It was like 1980, early 80s, I think. Actually, it was sort of the Star Wars time frame, may have been mid 80s. But that's when all these composites were getting excited. And it was probably some guy was trying to make magnesium you know, composites with ceramic and found that they were corroding faster than they thought, oh, I can use corrosion <laughs> to my advantage. Okay. Anyway, the point is, if you look at these things, you go from <laughs> what used to be a large area to a relatively small area where goodness is supposedly the area of this. Now this is pretty pretty shaky science here in terms of quantitative, okay? But qualitative, it's right, okay? The metal had this big area, the ceramic had this big area, and you marry the two of them and you've got something smaller than both, right? But it does have better strength. One dimensionally you improved it. The problem is we don't use materials one dimensionally in most cases. Okay, so that's that was my argument. 
15 years ago, and mostly I got thrown out of the room because people's research. So I'm going to go to a conference where people livelihood is based on extolling the advantages of uh, composite materials, and I go in and tell the story. It's not exactly what they want to hear. Okay. Um, in fact, the dean of Northwestern, one of this article, was another one I wrote about materials processing a few years later, and I got a comment back from someone that dean of Northwestern, who's a graduate, he's passed away now, but he was a graduate of this department and he became dean of engineering at Northwestern, and he read my article and says, "What's wrong with Eager?" <laughs> okay, because I wasn't ex saying that new materials are wonderful. What I've been trying to say back in those days was be cautious about new materials. And in fact, I guess that's um, uh, part of the problem. Composites, by their very nature, have more processing steps. I mean, that X33 space plane has many more steps. And so far as the tooling, they made the tooling cheaper because they knew they only had to make 10 of them. So they made the tooling expendable. Rather than having it fit together so they could unbolt it and everything and reuse it, they basically just welded it together and took an oxyacetylene torch to cut it apart to get the part off. And so I remember saying, well, why don't you just make another one? And they said, uh, I said, don't you have the tooling? They said, uh, no, we cut it up. <laughs> I said, why'd you cut it up? They said, well, we didn't make it reusable. They didn't design it to be reusable. This was, a, this was an experimental vehicle. You're going to cut the cost wherever you can. They could have made it reusable for another $10 million, OK? And then that way, when the $50 million unit tank, they could have built the next one for only $20 million, right? Or whatever. Uh, but so there are economies of scale. Uh, and it's just a, a problem with that. Um, In fact, there's another guy, the, the guy Williams, who replaced Sprague at General Electric um, at the same time around 1995 or 2000. Um, he had been a, a professor at Carnegie Mellon. I think maybe he'd been dean at Carnegie Mellon. And he went to General Electric. And he was big. He was a titanium guy. He was always talking about advanced materials and stuff. But he was at the university. Okay? And he went to General Electric. And within two or three years, he was, his, his take on this stuff is he talked about boutique materials. And he wasn't just talking about composites. He was talking about these advanced materials, whether it be a, a new type of metal or whatever, that had wonderful properties, just like Bob Sprague says, write it down the first time you hear about it, it doesn't ever be that good again. And Williams is the corollary, write down the cost when you first hear about it because you'll never see something that cheap again. He talked about them as boutique materials. They had such a specific application that they would never be used in large volume. Okay? So that's another problem. When you start marrying materials together, you actually cut down the potential applications. Okay? A monolithic material usually has more applications that the properties may not be as advanced, but they probably can be used for a lot of different things. Um, there are other problems that I didn't have on those repairability, okay? You might think of a, a, a disaster that happened because of repairability of the composite in an aircraft structure. Well, actually, that's a good example. That wasn't what I was thinking of, but yeah, the space shuttle is hard to repair those skins up front. It's hard to replace the ceramic tiles. The one I was actually thinking of is, you remember the American Airlines crash in New York, in New York on the tail about 15, 20 years ago, wherever it was? Plane taken off out of it was JFK or LaGuardia, but it was right over JFK. It was JFK? It's coming out of JFK and it's right over Brooklyn or Bronx or something. It began with a B in New York, right? Anyway, and it crashed. Um, and Professor Lagasse worked on that for American Airlines, but what they found was the tail had come off. Now the question is, did it come off because they were arguing over whether the pilots were doing maneuvers that they shouldn't have been doing? It actually taken off a little too close to the plane ahead of it, so there's turbulence in the wake behind them. And so there's an argument whether the pilots were not handling it property, properly in a lot of turbulence, or 
it just so happened in the build records they had had a major problem and that they had repaired in this composite tail. And guess where it broke? At the repair. Because when you put all these fibers in there, you're getting the strength by aligning the fibers. And when you have a, you break those fibers and you go in to patch it, and patch it with a Band-Aid basically, it's not as strong. You don't get 100% efficiency in that repair. So the repairability of composites in general stinks. Now my other example for you Navy guys is back in, uh, and this is actually a good example of mandating technology from the top, okay? Um, although my favorite example of mandating technology from the top was my first job at Bethlehem Steel Corporation. You've seen them repairing the rebar and bridges during the summer, okay, all through New England. They put salt on the roads, the salt gets down to the, the concrete, the, the steel corrodes, um, the expansion is like eight to ten times in volume when you form rust from the steel, and that expanding reinforced steel reinforcing bar in the, in the concrete causes the concrete to spall, exposing the rebar. If you don't, if you let that go too long, you'll end up with little flapping pieces of steel rods in the, in the highway, and someone comes along with a truck or something, and, up and it starts an accident. So they have to repair them. Costs a fortune. Okay? And it's because they put salt on the roads. You don't see this down in Florida. They don't put a lot of salt on the roads. Um, but in New England, during the summers, they're always repairing bridges on the interstates. We don't bother to do it on other bridges because we don't have the budget locally, but on the interstates they do. Um, well, this was a problem. And they even knew it in the mid-70s. Mid and so, uh, if you, what do they use now? When you go buy these things, what, what's the color of the rebar when you go buy there? It's not steel, it's green, right? Because they put a polymer coating on there, okay? You're now keeping the salt water from getting to the steel, okay? So it's a composite material, if you will, right? They solved it with a composite. But the rocket scientist managers <coughs> with the mentality they had, the only thing you can solve the steel problem with is more steel. So some manager had this bright idea, and at Bethlehem Steel we had a manual one inch thick that told us who we could write a letter to, okay? And I could write a letter to my boss, or if there was anyone below me, I'm not sure there was such a person, okay, when I worked there, but you could write up one level above or below, or you could write horizontal to another organization, like I was in research, and if I wanted to write over to sales engineering, I could write to one someone who was at my level over there, but I couldn't write to his boss. My boss had to write to his boss. So I still have old papers in there that I would write, but my boss would have to sign because if it was going to go over. Anyway, wonderful thing, just to think how much money was spent on something like that. Now you know why they're out of business. Um, but it's just the way big organizations work, what can I say? But the, so some manager at sales engineer, some general manager at sales engineering writes to the general manager at research and says, we should coat stainless, we should coat our carbon steel rebar with stainless steel. So it comes back down to the corrosion group, okay, at Bethlehem Steel in the research department. They say, bad idea, stainless steels don't do well in chlorides. <coughs> You'd have to use nickel-based alloys, which are way too expensive. You can never afford it. So it, the, the no answer bubbles the way back to the manager in, in, in research, goes over to the manager in sales, and <coughs> says, no, good idea, but probably not feasible. So the two of them get together for a nice fancy lunch, paid for by the company, obviously. They decide, well, let's do it anyway. So it's, <laughs> the thing comes back down to the engineers, do it anyway, even though you think it's the wrong thing to do, okay? Now, that was my first example of that. And my office mate, there were two, uh, two engineers in an office at research labs. My office mate had the job of welding, cladding the, the rebar with stainless steel. Actually, not, not individual rebar. They were cladding an ingot. And then they were going to roll it into a composite. Okay? So they did. They spent like $5 million, which back in 1975 was just real money. And they did a trial. And the whole thing was a disaster. Just like the engineer said. So I used to call it repealing the laws of physics by fiat. Okay. That happens all the time. So the same type of thing occurred uh, 
in, uh, what was my example that I was going to give you? Um, I don't remember. I was going to give you another example. What kind of stainless steel were they using? Um, it actually was a fairly high molybdenum. We, we can talk about that. I was going to talk about stainless steels in the next class. Maybe I'll get to it today. They couldn't. You said it maybe. Oh, maybe example. Um, anyway, go ahead. I'll try to think of what my maybe example was. Yeah. They couldn't use something maybe that wasn't austenitic that the chloride wouldn't attack, attack the passive layer, or they couldn't go lower in potential than not. Um, they might have, but a lot of the problems were just the fabricability. You're trying to hot roll two different materials with different mechanical properties, and so the thing would just fall off. But actually, even though they got like 20% yield, okay. They did put those in service, and it turns out the stainless steel they used, and who knows, maybe it was the top managers didn't want to spend the money for the better stainless, okay? Um, I don't know all the details um, of, of that, but I just know the whole thing was a disaster, and they ended up not, not doing anything with it. I can't remember my Navy example from the mid-80s. Yeah, it's technology. Oh, okay, well, anyway, the, the, whole, the whole thing in the, in the 1980s in Star Wars was Technology now started to be mandated from, from the top, okay? You had PhDs that you had hired, many of them MIT grads. My Navy contractor um, was a Dr. Bruce McDonald. That was a degree from this department, the guy that gave me my first research grant. And I saw from 1977 through 1985, those guys actually could make the technical decisions. But starting in 1985 with Star Wars and stuff, all of a sudden people at the top were deciding what the technology was and what would work. And they were determining that they'd spent all this money on composites. And then all of a sudden these guys who actually were competent engineers at what middle levels would roll their eyes and say, why are we doing this? Well, because it was being mandated from the top. Okay? And the same type of thing as repealing the laws of physics by fiat. Uh, maybe that was the example I was going to give. But but I've seen that, and what has happened, and I guess I first saw it in the mid-'80s, I think in my career, maybe I was just idealistic in my youth, um, I thought that actually people would pursue technical projects based on their merits, okay? But since mid-1980s, I realized that's just not true, okay? They pursue because someone read about, some manager read about it in the New York Times, okay? And so I guess in the mid-80s, there was ceramics fever in Japan, there was Star Wars in the United States, so that pushed ceramics and composites, which is when I started writing some of these articles about, this doesn't make sense, metals still are important, and everybody thought I was crackpot, except the steel industry, they loved my talks, okay? Um, and then, the next big thing was in 1989, we discovered high temperature superconductors. You could not get a research grant out of the National Science Foundation in 1990 unless it was on high temperature superconductors. Period. They just didn't do it. Because these things were going to change our lives. Well, they didn't change our lives. And in fact, I got myself in trouble again the first year I was on the department, the best department head. In the mid 90s, I was asked to give a talk to a bunch of industry people. And I didn't knock them in my talk, but someone asked me a question at the end, okay, about high temperature superconductors. I'd done my doctoral thesis on superconductivity. And I pointed out of the five faculty out of 35 in this department who had done work on superconductivity before high temperature superconductors, there were five faculty who had prior experience. By 1995, at least half the department were working on high temperature superconductors, even though they had no expertise whatsoever in high temperature superconductors, or in superconductors. And the, of the five faculty who had previously done work in superconductivity, my thesis advisor, myself, okay, and a few others, four of us would have nothing to do with high temperature superconductors. The only one who had research grants was the untenured. Okay, because he needed the money and this was a good way to get money, right? But the, those of us knew anything about superconductivity. So I pointed out at this little thing across the way over Kresge how, well, high temperature superconductors might be good for certain sensors, like trying to find big magnetic option, objects in the ocean from, from some satellite in space or something. Uh, but in terms of 
high field magnets, levitated trains, power transmission. I said we would not see that in, in our lifetime or our grandchildren's lifetimes. Pretty strong statement, right? Got back to my office half an hour later, I'm getting a phone call from a faculty member in the office that, who happened to have a grant from American Super Nerd Corporation, um, which was a spinoff of this department, which is still around and has taken tens of millions of dollars of Navy money to try to build super nerdy generators and has built prototypes. But um, he said, Tom, how could you say this? And I said, well, because I believe it, Mike. He said, well, what do you know about us? <laughs> he said, well, you don't know anything. I said, well, okay, that's your opinion. I said, you got your opinion, I got my opinion. Well, the next thing I know, he took me to the dean. Okay. Uh, actually, I told, I guess what I also said, things, quit acting like an eight-year-old. Okay. Now, I was his department head. But anyway, so I had to go to the dean. And the dean says to me, says, Tom, um, why did you tell Mike that he was acting like an eight-year-old? I said, well, because he was. That didn't go over well. See, I have this problem. Anyway. Um, and so Mike was sitting right next to me when the dean asked me that. Okay, anyway. Uh, so the dean is now president of Boston University. And anyway. Um, nonetheless, it's now 15 years later. Can any of you think of a large commercial application for high temperature superconductors? And I have had the forbearance when I see Mike not to say, hey Mike, how's it coming in the superconductivity business? Okay? Because he's moved on to other things. He's now working in biotech. So in 1989, um, there was no research money in anything in high, high, high temperature superconductors. And by 1995, it was all photonics and electronics. And uh, by 2000, it was biotech and nanotech, okay? I had to, last December, I had to review papers at the National Science Foundation, and I went down to this committee, and, and uh, we were reviewing like 30 different proposals. And my comment in the afternoon, I said, well, if nothing else, I learned how to spell the word nano by reading all this stuff. Uh, so we are now squandering billions of dollars of research money uh, because managers are re repealing the laws of physics by fiat. Um, anyway, composites have problems with repairability, other things. Joining, okay? You don't, it's not easy to join composites, okay? Um, to get full straight. Recyclability, okay? One of the most, the most complex composites we make are called electronics, okay? You got a little piece of silicon, and you got copper on that, you got titanium on that, and you got some polymer on that, and you got some ceramic as a substrate. I mean, you got every material known to man, and they're all mixed together. And the only ones you can recycle are the ones that contain gold, okay? Because it costs so much to take those materials apart that you put together, okay, that you have to have something really valuable. And so there's a process. I could take you down to Attleboro, Massachusetts, and there's a guy uh, who developed a process for ammonia leaching of low-value gold scrap. And if you look at the <clears throat> incoming loading docks, you will just see computer circuit boards and everything else. And they bring in these circuit boards, which are polymer composites and everything else, and they put it into this pressurized hydrothermal reactor that has a bunch of ammonia salts in it and it leaches out the gold and the silver okay now if it was just silver you couldn't afford all this because the amount of gold there is less than one one thousandth by weight right but gold has a value that's a hundred thousand no, ten thousand times the value of copper right remember my you know thing silver is hundred times the value of, of copper and gold is hundred times the value of silver and so you can basically extract out the gold, and if you can get that, and then you put all the rest of it in the landfill. But, you know, recycling is a serious problem with many composite materials. So anybody think of any other properties or multi dimensions of using a material? I mean, there's, there's actually dozens of them. Uh, but it depends on the application. So I guess the next thing I was going to do, 
as I was saying, gee, I didn't have very many composites. Where's the space plane? I got back back there. That's not that's not easy. Um, but I didn't. I thought, well, since I don't work on composites, I don't have very many composite materials. But in fact, I started looking on my shelf this morning, and I do have some composite materials. Here's one. It's called granite. Okay, <coughs> this is actually a fracture toughness specimen made out of granite. Uh, I got it from the guy who finished his PhD thesis when when I was starting as an assistant, the week I was starting as an assistant professor, he was finishing up. And he had taken on this project to try to understand why, why the Egyptian obelisk, okay, the obelisk is like the Washington Monument, and they have these things in Egypt, how they had ever erected those. Because at the current theories of fracture mechanics in 1970, when he started his thesis, the thing should have broken under its own weight when you lifted it up. Obviously, they had to make them in a horizontal, you know, do the stone cutting in a horizontal position, but then they had to raise them up vertical. Why didn't they break if you did the calculation? And it turns out, so he, he actually made fracture toughness specimens out of granite. There's one that was never broken. You put that in a loading machine, you pull on the crack and measure the crack growth rate. Turns out it's a much tougher material than just a monolithic rock. Because you've got a bunch of different phases, three phases, black, gray, and white in there, okay? And you form little micro cracks. You absorb energy by forming micro cracks in that structure. And it turns out they found, he found in his doctoral thesis that yes, the Egyptians really did just lift them up because the fracture toughness of granite was much better than anybody ever expected based on the fracture toughness of rock, of a monolithic rock, okay? So that's a, that's a natural composite material which has better properties, if you will, than uh, sandstone or something. Um, and actually, the ceramist picked up on that. That was like 1975 or 76 that he did his thesis. And they said, oh, we can make tough ceramics. But as you'll see in my article, when, I, when people use the word, we'll make tough ceramics, tough is a relative term. Tougher than other ceramics, tougher than glass. And, and I give the example, someone Back then, I had read some article. Someone had gotten a 100% increase in the fracture toughness of quartz glass. Okay, that's a pretty impressive improvement in properties, right? But you got to remember, when you start at the bottom, it doesn't take much to double something. And it turns out, at that point, the quartz glass had half the fracture toughness of gray cast iron, which means it wasn't really going to take over the world as a structural material. So when people talk about whether it's composites or whether it's advanced ceramics or whatever, this whole thing on advanced materials article, I, I give the six or seven ways that people extol the benefits, basically tell you half the truth. Okay? One is discussion of property improvements only on a relative rather than absolute scale, which is what I just said. They doubled the toughness. They said, oh, we have tough quartz. Yeah, still pretty brittle. It's not really useful. Use of inappropriate or carefully chosen adjectives. We talked about that. Specific electrical conductivity or competitive, okay? They, they use an adjective. You gotta be careful of those adjectives, okay? Discussion of the material one-dimensionally. That's, we've gone through that. Comparison of the properties of a new material with the current material. Um, and I didn't bring the exam. I do have a piece of this stuff, but a uh, guy at University of Pennsylvania, well, Allied Signal Corporation had was making amorphous metals. Uh, these are metals that don't have any crystalline structure. And, and they sent it to a guy at Penn University of Pennsylvania who could measure <coughs> magnetic properties, but they never signed a non-disclosure agreement. And he measured the magnetic properties and found this was the softest magnetic material in the world, which is exactly what you want for a transformer core, okay? It's a soft magnetic material, so you don't generate a lot of heat in the transformer. You've heard transformers humming during the summer, okay? Um, telephone poles, well, you could save like 3% of all the electricity in the country if you could afford to trans change all the transformers over. Well, the problem that Allied Signal had is this guy had the patent rights because he measured the property. He was the first one to measure the property. The University of Pennsylvania patented it, and then they got a big patent fight. And the University of Pennsylvania won. So if you ever are working on something, sign a non-disclosure. Uh, ignoring market volume, we've talked about that, okay? You may have the best material in the world, but if you're only going to sell three of them, it's going to be hard to make money. Ignoring the processing considerations, we've, tried to, we've talked about some of that. But having said that, 
I went to my shelf and I found a few other composites. This is a diamond conditioning pad. So this is a piece of piece of steel with a braze alloy on it, and there's this nice regular array of little diamonds on there. You know, take, I think, I don't know if I've ever taken that out of the package yet, probably. You can you can abrade your fingernail. Um, or whatever you want to do. Um, that's a composite material. I got diamonds embedded in braze alloy on a piece of steel. So I got, you know, it's a composite. And that's useful. Those things, I don't know, they probably cost $500 or something. Hey, I showed you this before. Ceramic coated turbine blade. It's a composite material. I couldn't get those properties. Okay, it may not be a composite of particulates in, or fibers in a matrix, but it's a coating, and any coated material is a form of composite. I'm not sure if I'm going to use this again. Um, this, or this, is an excellent example of composite material. Anybody know what this is? Catalytic converter substrate without platinum or palladium. palladium. So, what do you have? You, you need, yes? Isn't it kind of difficult to, to, to generalize properties of composites just because all the composite is is a combination of two or more materials and, and you yeah. know, a carbon fiber versus a, uh, a ceramic mix with, with whatever. I mean, Absolutely. <laughs> and one of the reasons I don't, this is the first time I've given it. I got asked a question yesterday about composites. So I created, this is my answer to that question. It was the end of the class. So the rest of you didn't hear the, the student answer the question. But I decided, OK, I'm going to take the class today and talk about composites. I will sometimes make disparaging comments about composites as I go along. I've said some positive things about composites. I'm not trying to give you some examples. Of, we use composites all the time. But part of the problem, and one of the reasons I don't like, I haven't spent a lot of time talking about composites in the past, is exactly what you're making. What is a composite? A lot of people like to think it's fibers in some matrix that give me a very strong piece of X, right? Well, if you take, if you, a composite is two materials married together to give you the benefits of both materials. That's my definition of a composite. Tire. A tire is a composite, okay? That's a very large volume composite, whether it's steel cord or polyester cord and, pop, and rubber. And you couldn't get those properties without making a composite. So we do use composites, but the problem is, how do you get something that's low enough cost? The big thing with advanced composites, and, and people talk about, Amory Lovins talks about composites, people are talking about aerospace composites. Well, aerospace is by definition $200 to $20,000 a pound. It's a whole different industry. Automotive company uses tires. I hadn't thought about tires, but it's an excellent example. Okay? It's a composite material. I actually have some other things that aren't motorized. Couldn't find my other one. I'm probably pass it around. But galvanized steel. I coat a piece of steel, and all of a sudden, and why am I doing it? I want the corrosive properties of the zinc with the strength and cost properties of the steel. What did I do when I zinc coated this? I doubled the price of the sheet metal. It goes from $600 a ton to $1,200 a ton. And all I did was put some one of the cheapest materials in the world on the surface. And I also really hurt my recyclability. One of the biggest problems in using electric furnaces is all the automotive scrap that comes back with zinc because the zinc fume coming off is a toxic material. Even though we put it on our noses and we eat it as a dietary supplement. But when it goes into a landfill, it's toxic. Do they call brass a composite? No, you don't call brass a composite. You call it an alloy. Although, that's where I said, you know, the metallurgists, well, what happens when people are talking about composites, just like nanotechnology, when, when people define a new term, everybody marches and says, oh, I'm doing that. And so the Wright Brothers engine was made out of an aluminum copper alloy. And I remember when nanotechnology came out, someone started talking about nanoprecipitates in aluminum alloys. Well, the Wright Brothers had that in their engine. Okay, it killed double hope. Um, we, in the 1920s, when we started using x-rays to look at metals, we call those Gunier Preston zones. I mean, they've been known for 90 years, okay? Um, but if nanotechnology is what you're selling, is what, is, is what something's buying, then that's what I'm selling, okay? Um, 
So you could call brass, a lot of your brasses are alpha beta brasses. Well, it's two copper alloys of different composition mixed together and you can get better properties when you have the two phases. So if you want to say that, all of a sudden all your metals become composites, okay? So how do you define a composite, okay? Composites can be as cheap as Portland cement or as expensive as the X33 space plane skin, right, for the hydrogen tank. So it's hard for me to come up with rules for composites other than people oversell them. That's a good rule, okay? Um, now, here's a composite. Anybody know what this is? It's bulletproof glass, protective armor systems, okay? Four layers, three of glass, one of polycarbonate, which is a plastic the polycarbonate layers the thinnest one, uh, which is actually polycarbonate by itself is sort of been used as a bulletproof glass, okay? It's a plastic that is extremely tough. Not all plastics are, are weak. Polycarbonate is extremely tough, probably tougher than steel in many ways, okay? Um, and so you layer this up, you put it together with adhesive bonding technology for this is pretty simple. They put it in an autoclave to adhesive uh, bond it, but uh, um, uh, that stuff, that came out of the same plant where they make the five and a quarter inch th stuff, which goes into the, what do they call the vehicles in the rack that will take the, the MRAP, uh, tank line? Go ahead. MRAP? MRAP, right, okay, material that came out. Mine re resistant ambush protected? Right, right. The MRAP vehicles, okay, that re replacing the Hummers so that you don't kill the troops. Um, but they also, turns out the President's limo also has five and a quarter inch windows, okay? Might look like a Cadillac, but not. Okay, um, baseball, that's a composite. I was just looking at the composites I had on my shelf. This happens to be another catalytic converter. I can pass this one around, it's not quite so heavy. This one's made out of a special stainless steel that will resist oxidation at very high temperatures. They were developing that one at Corning because most of the emissions now are due to when you start up, when everything's cold. Once that catalytic, catalytic converter is working, you can breathe what's coming. I mean, once it gets hot and starts working, you can breathe what's coming out of that exhaust pipe. There's almost no CO in there, okay? But, well, you can't breathe it all that well. It doesn't have a lot of oxygen, but, but you can breathe it. You wouldn't get carbon, carbon dioxide poisoning from it. It's during those first couple of minutes while that big hunk of ceramic is heating up. Okay, that you get all your bad emissions. And so as the EPA tries to make tighter and tighter regs, you're gonna to have to have something that has less thermal mass, and so that's, that happens to be a catalytic converter just made out of thin gauge sheet metal. Um, I showed you a carbon-carbon composite before. That's carbon and carbon. Some composites are metal and metal, so your question about brass is well taken. Well, that's a metal-metal composite if you want to be very broad. Everything's a composite unless something's extremely pure. I had a uh, piece of high, high voltage cable. So you got copper in the middle, you got insulation, you got rubber, you got a, a, steel, a, a steel sheath around it, okay, uh, for electromagnetic protection. This is a cage for a uh, part of a transmission, uh, a part of the inside of transmission is aluminized steel, and they need the aluminized surface on the steel for lubricity. Uh, so far as that goes, so hey, that's a composite. Um, that's not such a great example. This is some guys in the automotive industry who are trying to put steel and aluminum together, and that makes sort of a fine metallic material. This is a composite, okay? Uh, and I probably, just in some of the videos, I'll probably talk about this. Aluminum right? cladding. Uh, it's aluminum cladding on the bottom, that's right, and it's stainless steel here, and it's polymer on the inside. And just so you, I will tell this, I tell the story somewhere in one of the lectures about how they came to me and these things were, this is a hydrogen cracking story, which you'll hear on one of the videos. One of my, one of the things I'm doing here is letting you all see some of my, you know, little props that you will see on the videos. But they sent the, this is Faberware pot, so they make it in Brooklyn, they shipped it to Japan, everything was fine when it shipped out of Brooklyn took it off the boat in Japan and it had these cracks along the side. They bring it to my office and say, we don't know what's going on. It was fine when we put it on the ship and now it's got cracks. 
and I looked at it, the cracks were all around along the top. And I went and got my magnet, not magnetic here, up here. Ooh, really magnetic. So <coughs> I'll explain that later. But what happens, I said, well, it's hydrogen cracking. And what happens when you form the sheet metal uh, and deep draw it into the pot shape, you actually are deforming and stretching the metal um, at the top, whereas the stuff at the bottom is just being folded. It doesn't get as much deformation. 304 stainless steel, which I knew that's, that's the garden variety stainless steel, is um, normally non-magnetic, but if you deform it, you can make it magnetic. If you deform it, you, you change the crystal structure into something that is very susceptible to hydrogen and brittle, just like HY80. Okay? And so I said, where's your hydrogen coming from? I said, I said, well, we use we plasma sprayed the inside with stainless steel to get good adhesion of the polymer coating. That's a hundred dollar pot. Okay? There's a lot of technology goes into that. Okay. So I said, and what do you use for your plasma gas? And they said, 95 argon, 5 hydrogen. <laughs> okay, so there's their hydrogen. Okay? So they were taking ferritic stainless steel. They thought it was austenitic, non-magnetic stainless, but it turns out I proved it to them right there with my magnet. And so the problem solved. That's another problem I have. Is <clears throat> I've been told you should, I've been told by other experts and consultants, you don't tell the customer the answer right away. You could have just told them to not let the ship get too cold. Uh, well, it's not how cold the ship gets. Well, isn't there, with the austenetic, the uh, susceptibility range is going to be much higher, right? Like 90 or so degrees, and then the other stuff could be around zero? Um, well, it depends on the steels, but it turns out the most common cracking range for hydrogen and brittleman is room temperature. That's one of the wonderful things in life. With the okay. ferritic, right? With the ferritic, yeah. Well, the ferritic is the only one that's going to be cracking. It's not the austenitic that's cracking there, it's the ferritic. The cracks only started at the top. And in fact, when I got that, the cracks weren't <coughs> as long as they are now. It continues uh, just under the forming residual stresses to grow, but it stops when it runs out of ferrite. Okay? As far as that goes. Okay, about that. Here. So I've spent a couple minutes. Pardon me? Even now, I think 600, I think. So uh, even now, 600 is. is well, actually, even copper is susceptible to hydrogen and oil under certain conditions, but they're very specialized conditions. And um, I wouldn't, uh, well, the, the BCC, the body center cubic metals, are a thousand times more susceptible to hydrogen embrittlement than the FCC alloys. The austenitic alloys are susceptible, and Ingen L6700 is, an, is a susceptible alloy, but you must have some experience with something like a nuclear or something where you can help have hydrogen cracking, okay? Where you have a lot of current creating lots of hydrogen because it takes a lot more hydrogen potential in certain alloys. I've only seen hydrogen cracking in copper once in my life, okay? But I've seen it. But most people have never seen it. So the problem with trying to prevent hydrogen assisted cracking is that you're going to induce stress corrosion cracking with by switching materials, right? It's well, if you, it turns out there is a difference between hydrogen assisted cracking and stress corrosion cracking, and that has to do with the polarity, one's positive and one's negative. But most books, 80% of the metallurgists will tell you that they are the same thing, but the fact they're not. They have difference in polarity, so I'm not sure where. I got pretty wrapped around the axle with this because you read Danny Jones's book, and it says, "Here's what you do to prevent, you know, hydrogen-assisted cracking, and it's everything that causes stress corrosion cracking." And it says everything to prevent stress corrosion cracking is everything that induced hydrogen-induced cracking. Um, well, I'm not sure. I would say. Well, I mean, quite that no, it wasn't that simple, I mean, but it was like. Then the trick question is, what's the best material? And it's like, which one's worse? Okay. I couldn't. Yeah. Okay. Well, what what we can say about some of this is hydrogen induced cracking or stress corrosion cracking are typically the causes are typically given by a simple Venn diagram with three circles you got to have a stress you've got to have a corrodent and you've got to have a susceptible material 
Okay. So you said who's Jones? Who Jones's book? Not Russell Jones's. Book. No, the one they're using for three, five, four, and seventy-two. The uh, oh. the Danny Jones, the guy at UNR. Oh. That's oh, what the Ballinger's course is using. I don't right know now. what he's using. Okay, I'm not familiar with that book. Uh, but it turns out the corrodent can either be a salt or it can be hydrogen. So you can use the same thing. Now hydrogen is a positive uh, ion corrodent and most of your other corrodents are negative. And stress corrosion occurs at the anode and hydrogen cracking occurs at the cathode if it's a corrosive process. Now you don't have to have a corrosive process. Hydrogen can do it all by itself under stress without any electrochemical thing particularly. So stress corrosion is sort of a, a broad term that can you can have hydrogen cracking as a subset. So if we want if I want to say under stress corrosion cracking I can separate that into hydrogen cracking and stress corrosion cracking. And the problem we have is we're talking about stress corrosion on two different levels. One, we're including hydrogen cracking, and the other one, we're separating it out as this is anode, and this is cathode. And this, we're using stress corrosion cracking more generally, too. We don't care whether it's anode or cathode. Does that help? Yeah, I do. Thanks. There's, there's confusion all through the metallurgical literature on this, okay? So I'm not surprised that you and I are confused a little bit about talking about this. It just all gets grouped into this whole environmentally, you know, induced cracking section. And it's right, to, right. It's hard to pick out which one's what. And what we really, some people, instead of calling it stress corrosion cracking up here, call it environmentally induced cracking. So the stress corrosion is down here, and hydrogen is over here. But a lot of people use stress corrosion cracking for what is really environmentally induced cracking, which includes hydrogen cracking. That's my point. So be careful when you read the literature, okay? I actually, this became very, very <clears throat> painful to me uh, one time. Uh, some guys over here near the airport will put in a, a heat treating system to make steel toes for steel toe boots, okay? And so this was a nitrate, nitrite salt solution where they're gonna heat the, the steel and quench it and temper it and stuff. And so they welded up this big steel tank. And when I say big steel tank, it was like, like this room, but about 10 times as long. They, would, they make a lot of steel toes, okay? Um, and um, I knew it had to do with, when they added the salt, they added some water that they should have added to the salt. And they ended up getting these nitrites and nitrates. And I went to the literature, and it says, oh, you can get stress corrosion cracking in, uh, in steel um, when you have the wrong combination of nitrite and nitrate. One's NO2 and one's NO3. So I set up a little experiment to prove that I, I looked at it and said, oh, this looks like hydrogen cracking. And at the time, I knew that there was a difference, but I had never really experienced it. And we set up a little <coughs> electrochemical cell, and I made the anode the, the sample that I wanted to crack, crack, crack. We made some, we took some of the welds and we took some U-bend specimens. You just take the steel and bend it into a U and you have residual stresses from the bending of the U. And I stuck it in the solution and I made it the positive anode. I could not get the thing to crack. We wasted $5,000 trying to get this sucker to crack and I couldn't crack it. And then one time driving home I thought, I wonder if this is one of these cases where it really is hydrogen cracking rather than stress corrosion cracking, even though the literature says it's stress corrosion cracking. So I switched the polarity, cracked right away. I could have done the $200 test if I had the polarity correct when I spent $5,000 trying to crack it when it was positive. So there is a difference in this specific mechanism. One is hydrogen is weakening the steel and getting into the steel and causing the cracking. The other is actually a corrosive dissolution mechanism, okay, at the anode. So stress corrosion cracking is actually lots of different, it's sort of like saying cancer, okay? Cancer is like 300 different diseases of the body, okay? Stress corrosion cracking is like 30 different 
methods of attack of metals. And hydrogen cracking is there's probably only three or four different types of hydrogen cracking. That you still look skeptical. But I'm trying to take a face center cubic or a body center cubic to make a material to make something out of it. Yeah. And I need to it seems like if I pick one, I make one oh. failure more likely, but then to prevent that, I make the other failure more likely. Okay, now I see where you're coming from. You're absolutely right. If I'm talking FCC or BCC, the austenitic alloys are very resistant to hydrogen cracking, but they're very susceptible to stress corrosion cracking. That's absolutely true, and we're talking particularly stainless steels. I didn't know what you meant. I didn't realize you were talking that type of specific alloy selection. Yes. And then, it, and then the reverse would also... Yes. The, the ferritic stainless steels are very easy to hydrogen crack, but they are much better in stress corrosion cracking. In fact, next time I will start talking about some stainless steels, and just to give you a little more Navy stuff, okay? I use this book, Corrosion of Stainless Steel, by A. John Cedrics. A. John Cedrics is a, a science officer at Austin Naval Research, okay? And he spent his life. And if you look in here on stress corrosion cracking, he will tell you that the ferritic steels are much better in stress corrosion cracking, but they are also a thousand times worse in hydrogen cracking, which is why I started out saying, be careful, don't mix the two of them together. Okay, there is a difference between hydrogen and stress corrosion cracking, and in that sense, you're absolutely right. It depends on the, the different crystal structures, but for different reasons. Okay, I don't, we don't have time right now to go through. But we 